So I just finished a personal history of Niels Bohr and how and why he made his model, where he skimped on the details of the mathematics. And after I published it, I was asked to make another video where I showed you the details of how he made this model. And specifically, how did he get to the restrictions on the radius, the energy of the electron, and the energy and the frequency of the light produced by the electron. So you asked for it, here you go. Let's go. Electricity, 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 electricity. Before I start, I'd like to give a tiny backstory. Now I often use the word quantize, which is defined by the dictionary as Quote, to restrict a variable quantity to discrete values rather than to a continuous set of values. This whole idea of restricting things, specifically energy, to discrete values started in 1900 when Max Planck restricted the energy of light to be in little energy packets where the energy equaled the constant H, now called Planck's constant, times the frequency of light given by the Greek letter nu, which, yes, looks like a V. Anyway, 11 years later, Ernest Rutherford had a theory that the majority of an atom is smushed into a tiny nucleus, which is assumed to be positive to counter the electrons, which are negative. Rutherford didn't know what this meant about the electrons. Maybe they were evenly distributed. Maybe they were in a big ring like Saturn. Maybe there were many rings. He didn't know, and frankly, he didn't really care. But his student, Niels Bohr, did care. In fact, Niels Bohr was attempting to mesh the idea of quantized energy with the idea of a nucleus and electrons when he was reminded by a colleague that there was an equation for the frequency of light produced by burning hydrogen called the Balmer formula. And as he recalled years later, quote, as soon as I saw the Balmer formula, the whole thing was immediately clear to me. Even more impressively, Bohr also found that he could use his new formula to explain strange shadows from a star as being from ionized helium. Let me explain how he did this. I'm gonna split this video into five parts. One, tiny backstory. Done. Two, Bohr's assumptions. Three, why Bohr made his assumptions. Four, the math and five, his conclusions for hydrogen and helium plus. Bohr made six assumptions in his July 1913 paper. One, in this first paper, he only dealt with systems with one electron. Two, the electron spins around the nucleus in a stable orbit, which he assumed to be a circle. Three, the electron can only circle around the nucleus at set position, although the electron can magically jump between one state to another in a quantum leap. And no, Bohr did not use the word magic. Four, the energy of light produced is equal to the change in energy of the electron as it jumps between states. Five, all classical laws of physics apply with three exemptions. A, he knew that in classical physics, objects don't just jump between positions. B, in classical physics, a rotating charged particle will radiate energy and spiral into the nucleus. But Bohr just basically said, nope, not for my electrons. And C, in classical physics, the energy of the light produced is due to the energy of the electron. In this theory, the light is created due to the change in energy. And six, the position of the electron is quantized with the rule, the work needed to remove the electron equals an integer times Planck's constant times the frequency of the electron's orbit divided by two. Part three, why did Bohr make these assumptions? Bohr started with a single electron moving in a circle because he wanted to be as simple as possible. He also, remember, wanted to derive Balmer's formula from simple principles. And Balmer's formula is the frequency of light produced by hydrogen, and hydrogen only has one electron. Note that Bohr did not assume that the nucleus only has one proton. So his theories would work for hydrogen and for helium plus, helium missing one electron, or lithium plus plus, lithium missing two electrons, etc., etc., etc. Quantum mechanics at this time consisted of using the regular rules of classical physics, but then adding a quantum twist to some of it, like the energy. So it wasn't controversial 
to make the energy quantized and therefore the position quantized. What Bohr basically said was, hey, if I can break one rule, why can't I break a few more? So he also made a rotating electron not produce light so that he didn't have to deal with the electron spiraling into the nucleus. And he separated the energy of the light from the energy of the electron so that his equations would work. Stating that the energy of radiation is unconnected to the energy of the electron was what really shocked many people, including Einstein. However, this is also what has endured from Bohr's model. We still think that electrons radiate light with an energy equal to the change in energy of an electron. Since Bohr disassociated or separated the energy of the electron from the energy of the light it produced, he could put any limitation he wanted to on the electron. He then set the limit that the work needed to remove an electron from an atom W to be NH omega over two, where omega is the frequency of rotation of the electron, which begs the question, why divide by two? Well, in the paper, Bohr made an argument about averaging the work from the state of no motion, which leads to the two. He also might have divided by two because then the equations work out well for hydrogen. It turns out that for a circular orbit, this limitation is equivalent to quantizing the angular momentum so that mvr equals nh over two pi. But this was his conclusion, not his initial proposal. As I will show you right now in the math. Let's start with a single electron of charge E and mass M moving in a circle around the nucleus of charge ZE, where Z is called the atomic number and represents how many protons you have at a radius R and constant speed V. The only significant force on the electron is electrical. So using Coulomb's law, we get that the electrical force is Coulomb's constant K times the charge of the electron E times the charge of the nucleus ZE divided by the distance squared, which can be simplified to be Z times KE squared divided by R squared. Now, according to Newton's law, force equals mass times acceleration. And an object moving in a circle at constant speed has an acceleration of V squared over R. Let's call this equation one. The work needed to remove an electron from an atom, which we will label W, is the potential electrical energy holding the electron in the atom which is Coulomb's constant times the two charges divided by the distance minus the electron's kinetic energy, one half mv squared. If you multiply equation one by r, you get that zke squared over r equals mv squared, or that the potential energy equals twice the kinetic energy. Since one mv squared minus a half mv squared equals a half mv squared, W can be reduced to be one half mv squared, which is the same as half the potential energy, or zk's e squared over two r. Let's call this equation two. This is as far as you can get without quantum restrictions. As I said earlier, Bohr restricted his atom so that the work needed to remove an electron was quantized to equal nh omega over two, where as I said before, n is an integer, h is Planck's constant, omega is the frequency of rotation. Plugging that into equation two and multiplying by two, we get that n h omega equals mv squared. Now we need an expression for omega, the frequency of rotation. If the electron is moving in a circle at a constant rate, then the velocity is distance over time, where the distance is the circumference, or two pi times the radius, and the frequency is one over time. Dividing by two pi r, we get that the frequency equals V over two pi R. And plugging that into the equation above and dividing by V and multiplying by R, you get that the classic angular momentum and VR equals NH over two pi. This is where most derivations start. Let's call that equation three. Now we're ready to get to the results. First, we're gonna solve for the possible positions of the electron, i.e. the allowed radii. Let us start with equation one. Multiply both sides by r squared. Then divide both sides by z k e squared. Finally, multiply the right side by m over m. The numerator is the angular momentum mvr squared, which using equation three 
can be replaced with nh over 2 pi squared to get r equals n squared h squared over 4 pi squared k z e squared m. Woo! I would like to rearrange this equation by taking n and z out. So we get r equals n squared over z times a naught, where a naught equals h squared over 4 pi squared m e squared k. a naught is a constant. We can plug and chug, and it turns out that a naught is 0.53 angstroms. Side note, I use the word not for that little zero next to the a because that's the way I was taught. Not standing for the old English term for nothing, as in, he was not but a worthless fool. Not like, not like you're not going to get any candy, or not like I'm tying a knot. We are now in a position to figure out the work needed to remove an electron from a certain energy level n. Plugging our new definition of the radius into equation 2, we get w equals z k e squared divided by 2n squared a naught divided by z. Rearranging so that the z's and the n's are in front gives us z squared over n squared times k e squared over 2 a naught, which equals z squared over n squared times, ready? 2 pi squared k squared e to the fourth times m divided by h squared. Plugging numbers in, Bohr got that the work is z squared over n squared times 13 electron volts. With the current values of e, m, h, and k, however, it is valued at 13.6 electron volts, which is what I'm going to use for the rest of the video. This also means that for hydrogen, where z equals 1, the energy to remove an electron from the lowest state is 13.6 electron volts, which means that the lowest state has an energy of negative 13.6 electron volts. The next state is negative 13.6 divided by 2 squared, which is negative 3.4 electron volts, and the next is negative 13.6 divided by 9, which is 1.51 electron volts, and so on. More dramatically, Bohr predicted that the light was produced when the electron jumped from one state to another, which is equivalent to the difference of work needed to remove an electron from one shell, Nb, versus another shell, Na, which equals 13.6 electron volts times z squared times 1 over Nb squared minus 1 over Na squared. If, as Planck postulated, the light has an energy of h nu, where nu is the frequency of light, then by dividing by h, you get that the possible frequencies of light would be 13.6 electron volts times z squared divided by h times 1 over nb squared minus 1 over na squared. Now astronomers tend to deal with 1 over wavelength, not frequency, but luckily the speed of a wave equals the frequency times the wavelength. So we can replace the frequency with c over lambda, where c is the speed of light, and the Greek letter lambda is the wavelength. If I divide by c, we get 1 over wavelength equals 13.6 electron volts over hc times z squared times 1 over nb squared minus 1 over na squared. We can rewrite this as r times z squared times 1 over nb squared minus 1 over na squared where r is 2 pi squared k squared m e to the fourth divided by c h cubed. Now for the hydrogen atom, z equals 1. And this is exactly, exactly the empirical equation, or the equation from experiment without theoretical backing, called the Balmer series for the frequency of light from burning hydrogen, where r is called the Rydberg constant. But Bohr had another trick up his sleeve. He started reading about other spectrum and found this very unusual spectra called the Pinkerton series, named after the boss of the woman who discovered it, Wilhelmina Fleming, that discovered that the star had an unusual pattern that looked like a Balmer series with half integers. In 1912, the year before Bohr published his paper, a scientist named Alfred Fowler had reproduced these lines in the laboratory with a mixture of hydrogen and helium which he attributed to hydrogen, or something he called proto-hydrogen with half integers. Bohr thought maybe his model could solve the mystery. He realized that the z squared in the equation for the possible frequencies meant that the resulting frequencies from a helium plus atom, 
or a helium atom with two protons but only one electron would look exactly like a hydrogen atom with half integers. The reason he thought this was helium plus and not regular helium is remember, Bohr assumed there was only one electron and regular helium has two electrons. Anyway, this fact, solving the mystery of the helium lines, was what convinced many people that Bohr had hit on something important. Interestingly, Alfred Fowler, the scientist who had made the experiments with hydrogen and helium, was not convinced and wrote that his new lines were not exactly equivalent to multiplying the Rydberg constant by four, they were equivalent to multiplying it by 4.0016. Picky picky. Anyway, this objection made Bohr realize that he'd made a small mistake in his calculations. Even though the nucleus is far heavier than the electron, the charge of the electron does cause the nucleus to wibble wobble a little bit, which changes the energy of the electron. Bohr knew from planetary physics that you needed to deal with something called the effective mass, defined as m1 times m2 divided by m1 plus m2. Bohr then showed that with his effective mass correction, the new Rydberg constant is multiplied by 4.00163. Currently, we define Rydberg constants the same way as Bohr derived it to be. Because of the order that Bohr derived everything, we often derive Rydberg's constant for an infinitely big nucleus with no wobble, then adjust it with the effective mass for a nucleus we are dealing with. Woo! So there's the math of how he derived his model. Thanks for watching my video. Big thank you to my Patreons for supporting me. If you want to be thanked as well, there's a link down below. And if you're interested in the history of any of this stuff, check out my other videos. Okay, you stay safe out there. Bye.